Uh, hello, everybody. Welcome to this uh, one hour session on uh, an intuitive understanding of machine learning. With this, uh, so until some point ago, uh, the programming was kind of getting a bit boring for me, wherein it's the same kind of classes that you write and all those things. But then now, after I started working on machine learning, so programming has kind of uh, rekindled. Uh, there are a lot of interesting problems to solve the way you write this program itself is a lot more different. So, so this kind of excites me about uh, uh, writing programs on machine learning. So I thought it's a good uh, thing to uh, introduce uh, have a better way of thinking about machine learning from what I have seen. Uh, what does it mean when somebody says a machine learns and how do you make a machine learn and uh, so all those kinds of things. So for that matter, one of the recent uh, things I did uh, on machine learning was for a financial company, uh, wherein uh, we had to create a, pro a platform, uh, which is basically a model serving platform, wherein uh, the data scientists can go there and tweak some parameters, and then it helps you to score certain models there. So that was, that was a nice thing to do there, and in that I used uh, a kind of algorithm called as a regression. And now with working on machine learning, so most of the times I'm programming on Python itself. So, so yeah, so as uh, Vasan started off, uh, the agenda is we will start off with what basically is machine learning, why are we talking about it now, an intuitive way of, to understand how machine learning works, what is the technology stack, and I also have, so if you are interested to start working on machine learning, so what is the roadmap of learning that you need to take, so, uh, so I find this topic a lot interesting. I hope this one hour that we spent together, uh, you find it the same. So with that, uh, let me start off. So, now this has become a common sight, right? Uh, so it's a cartoon, not though in the real setting. So it basically says, customers who bought this item also bought this, right? So what, uh, so any website that we log into, Amazon or Flipkart or any e-commerce website, now does this. So it is one thing, if you want to buy a mobile worth 20,000, it is one thing to show all other mobiles worth 20,000, right? So that, that would just be a regular uh, database query and that will show you all the things. Then what is interesting is, if you try to buy a mobile, it will also tell that. So along with this mobile, you may also want to buy screen guard, you may also want to buy uh, or an SD card which goes with this and all those things. Right? So it is not really possible for the lacks of products that are there for somebody to sit and manually do a mapping of all these products. Right? Because they are from different categories. So screen guard and the mobile are different categories of products. Right? So that is what that is where a machine learning algorithm will sit and what that would basically do is it would basically look at all the customers who would have bought products from that company. And then based on that, so people would have bought a lot more uh, 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 items. And based on that, it will try to figure out what are the things that people are most frequently likely to buy. And based on that, it makes predictions that maybe because you are interested in mobile, you may also be interested in this, this, and this product. So thereby, one, it is helping you optimize your time and do your purchases at one shot. At the same time, for the company, this algorithm is helping them increase their ticket size. So one thing, it's very difficult to somebody to come on the web page. It is very difficult to make them look at a product. And now that they are seeing the product, you also make them buy some items along with it which they really want. So that's what this machine learning algorithm would do. And this is the kind of thing that you will very commonly see across many products that are coming out now. And the second important thing is, so, yeah, so this is, this is also a product it would appear on the that your gut feeling was also the digestion. Uh, Aditya? Hello, Aditya. And you really need to the top of data which will assist you in making business decisions. A very important point there. So if you write a program and then say that, okay, it's a machine learning program and then it does its job, but then can that program really help you to drive business decisions? That is where 
the biggest importance of machine learning and data analysis are okay uh, yeah I have a, a thing here so people are not able to uh, some of you are not able to hear uh, the content is uh, is it okay now are you able to hear me Lot of echo. So, do you see the echo even now? Uh, so, hmm? kind of changed a couple of settings here. Yeah. Okay. Uh, so, let me continue on that. Uh, hopefully, I guess it should be better now. All right, cool. Thanks, thanks for that feedback. I do not see the full name. I just see it as guest here. Thanks a lot. Okay, so good. So now, uh, so a lot of business decisions are being driven by machine learning algorithms and data analysis that happens behind it. So that makes it all the more important for us to start working on uh, machine learning uh, areas of products. Right? And then, so who better to who better to talk about machine learning and the features than Gartner? And Gartner says that it's going to be a 3.9 trillion dollar industry, not far away, just in 2022. So we are at we are at a very good junction here, wherein businesses have started to now implement machine learning. So there are a lot of factors which are complement which are contributing to it. Uh, it can be about uh, the data getting cheaper, the machines getting cheaper, the computation getting cheaper. So all these kinds of things have contributed and now every product aims to have some kind of machine learning algorithm that sits behind it. So by Gartner, decision support or augmentation based systems. Right? So systems which help you to make some decision. I'm going to launch this marketing campaign, is it going to help me? So can I predict how much my customer might buy or what is the value of the customer for me in the next one year? So those kind of uh, systems which will help you to make better decisions. So those kind of systems are set to kind of occupy 44% of the global value of what uh, uh, machine learning can do. And virtual agents. Uh, so when I say virtual agents, when you call uh, uh, a company, so what kind of uh, uh, algorithm can pick up that call. So if we want to place a trade on the website and what kind of agent can place that trade. So all those virtual agents, another 26% of the global value. The last point is very interesting for me. That is decision automation. So it is one thing to show some data and then tell that, okay, uh, this, is, uh, this is the data and based on this data, you take a decision. So that's okay. Uh, the wherein still some judgment is coming into picture. But decision automation is an area where the system itself can take the decision. So that's something really powerful that you can do with the system. And that is supposed to kind of take up 16% of the market uh, of all the applications that uh, ML can start to cater to. So that's a pretty big market and we are at the right junction of it uh, to start implementing all those technologies there. So, uh, when you say machine learning and if you kind of sift through all the hype and all the noise that has been created around it, there's really some really sound techniques that are happening behind it. But before that, let us look at a widely quoted definition of machine learning by Tom M. Mitchell. So there is a very good book written by Tom M. Mitchell also about machine learning. So there he says, a computer program is set to learn from experience E with respect to some class of task T and performance measure P, if its performance at task T as measured by P improves with experience E. Okay, so if this is the first time you are hearing this and if you are like me by this time, I think uh, you are completely in that loop of inception about what is happening with this definition, right? So in this one hour that we spend, I will try to make this definition as clear as possible and that is where the real understanding of machine learning lies. So let us start off with this 
uh, uh, steps of intuition. So I have a graph like this, wherein I have some data points with me, 1, 3, 2, 5, and 4, 7. And, and if I were to ask you, if I were to say, okay, this is the data point that I have, and if I were to tell you that given the point x as 3, what would you say would be the corresponding y-axis? So I'll just give you, give you a moment there. I'll just try to see what answer you come up with. So these are the only data points that I have, 1, 3, 2, 5, and 4, 9. So now if x value is 3, what would be the corresponding value of y? So then, now let us put in some terminology to what we are talking there. When I say given the value of x to be 3, what is the value of y? This x is called as the feature because it is the feature that is helping me to understand uh, a target value. That is the data that I already have. And y is called as the target value that we are talking about. So that is one of the basic terminologies when you start working with machine learning. Okay. So now by this time, I think you would have thought that, okay, so if x is 3, the value of y may be 7, uh, if we really did the math there, or somewhere around 7 is what you would have thought that. So, so how did we make that decision? If you think about it, at one level, it's a visual decision that we did, but more importantly, in our minds, we basically did a straight line that passes through 1, 3, 2, 5, and 4, 9, and once I have this straight line with me, when somebody says what is the value with 3, then we would say something like, okay, so where does this intercept the line that I have and that corresponding value of y is, I would say the value of it is 3, 7 and that's how we would have answered it, right? So even though we would have done it visually in an intuitive way, but this is how we would arrive at that answer. So this line that we have, the equation of it. Now if I try to solve, so I have x is 1, y is 3 and all these values. And if I try to solve for that line equation, that line gets this equation which says y is equal to 2x plus 1. So that's the equation of the line that I have here. So this, when I say this is the equation of the line y is equal to 2x plus 1, then now you give me any value of x then I will be able to say what is the value of y. So that's pure math there. So here, so as we spoke, y is the target and x is the feature that we have. And so c, this is called as the intercept. Oh, sorry, uh, I think I made, I made a decision there. So here, the C is the intercept and this M is the coefficient that we have, that is 2 in this case. So this intercept is a nice thing. So what this intercept basically means is, if X were to be 0, where would it cut the Y line? So this is what we call as the intercept C there. And in this case, that intercept is 1, of course, because if X is 0, then the value of Y would be 1. So this was easy for us. But now let me add some confusion to this. In, in any real... Okay, in any real data from uh, the industry, the data will never be in this kind of a straight line that we spoke of. Right? So the data will always have some noise, some confusion in the data. So instead of giving you a data which lies on the straight line, now if I were to give you a data which is a little skewed, and now if I ask you, what do you think would be the value of y given the value of x is something, now it becomes a difficult activity. I cannot come up with line equations for any and every curve that is there. So maybe I can do it for a sine wave or a cosine or something like that, but not for every line that comes up, right? So now this is where I need to come up with some kind of a strategy to answer my customers. So my customers are asking me the question, what would be the value of y given the value of x to be 3? So the strategy that I would come up is, 
I can only come up equations, I can only come up with equations for straight lines, but for curves, so now what I would say, I know that there is some kind of confusion in the data, there is some kind of noise in the data, so now, so I'll, I'll ignore about the noise, I will think the best straight line that I can draw is the line that passes through the most number of points. So say for example, there was one more point here, there was one more point here, then I would say that if I can draw a line which passes through the most number of points that I have, then I would say that is the line that I have and then okay, now I can answer you. But there can be some uh, 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 mistake in the answer because there is confusion in the data. Okay, so if that is the strategy that I come up with. Now with the data points that I have, now there can be two lines that passes through two points. So one line which says y is equal to 2x plus 0 and that is passing through 1 comma 2 and 4 comma 8 and another line which is passing through 2 comma 5 and 4 comma 8 which says y is equal to 1.5x plus 2. So now it becomes an interesting point. The strategy was good when I said that if the line passes through the most number of points that's the line but now here I have two lines which passes through most number of points and which line should I pick? If you were to choose the red line, then when your customer asks what is the value for 3, then you would have answered somewhere here. Right? So, uh, and if your customer, if you had chosen the blue line, then you would have answered the value to be somewhere here. So that is where it gets interesting to solve this problem. Now, now I have two lines. So how can I pick the best possible line among these two lines. So for me to decide which line to choose, then the way I would say is, if it is y is equal to 1.5x plus 2, and if I try to answer for 1, then I would get the answer somewhere here. So my thing would be maybe 1 comma uh, 1.5, uh, uh, 1.5 plus 2, say somewhere around 3.5 or something like that. But then it, but I know that the value for 1 is 2, right? Because I chose this red line, it's telling me it's 3.5. So there is definitely some difference between what was the actual data point versus what data point I gave the answer as. Similarly, if I had chosen the blue line, then I would have said the value for 2 is somewhere here and I would have I would have replied telling that it is 2 comma 4. So now also there is some kind of a difference. But this is where the trick lies. Now for me to choose the best possible line, so I say that the best possible line is the one which gives me the most minimum error. So here it seems like 2 comma 4 is giving me the most minimum error here. So when I have a line which passes through more than, uh, I mean more than one line which passes through the same number of points, then I will pick that line which gives me the least error so that even though I make a mistake in answering uh, a question, the error that I give is the smallest. So that error that you have when your data has some confusion there, that is called as the residual in machine learning language. So, so now, once that I say that, the best line which passes through, which has the least residual is the best line that I have, then my first strategy of coming up with a line which passes through most number of points is not really necessary to think about it. There can be one line somewhere in between here which doesn't go through any of the points, but the sum of the residues for this line is the minimum. So this line might have an equation of its own and that would be the best line for me to choose when I have confusion in my data. So this is an interesting problem. Previously when we took straight line, it was pure math. It was easy for me to solve for this equation. But here I have data which has confusion. Now I want to try out many, many lines and I have to say out of all these many lines I have one line which has the least uh, error 
and that is the best line that I can choose, that is a difficult task which we cannot do by a trial and error method there. So now let us, so here we, we looked at few of the terminologies wherein we said target, feature, intercept and coefficient. So now let us try to apply this understanding that we got with these straight lines to some kind of a real world problem. So at this point, let me just quickly check if there are any questions have come in through the chat. Okay. Yeah. Okay. So now, let us look at a real life example. So this house price prediction uh, is also called as the hello world of the prediction examples. So now, now if I, if I take this example here, Now, if I say there are two houses of the same, uh, uh, say, square foot, so will I be able to sell both the houses at the same price? Definitely not, because it is not only the square area that decides the price of the house, so it can also be the construction material that you have used or the area in which the house is, or for example, if you are a parent, then the number of schools nearby might might make an, uh, a, a decision point for you or number of ATMs nearby. So it means that, so now previously when, we, when I said y is equal to mx plus c, there the only feature we had was one feature which was x. But in this case, I have many such features which are affecting the target value that is y for me. So now the job of me is I have the data about all the houses in this vicinity and for what amount these houses have been sold. Now when a new customer comes to me asking that okay these are the details of my house and for how much can I sell this house then I need to give a better answer, the closest answer that I can. And on this space Another important thing to note here is when I have these many features, right, not all the features will affect the price in the same way. What I mean is if the total area increases by one unit and if number of ATMs increases by one unit, so just do a mental uh, uh, thought process here. So what do you think would affect the price more? Total area or the number of ATMs? Definitely, the total area has a higher effect on the house price than the number of ATMs. So that gives us one more level of complexity. The first level of complexity was the confusion in the data because not all data is the same. The second level of complexity is the feature is not just one, but I have many features. And the third level of complexity is all of these features, I know they are affecting my target value, but then they are not affecting the same way. So that is called as correlation. So a feature which is affecting my end price higher is said to be more correlated than the feature that is not affecting that much. It does affect, but not as much as the total area. So that kind of correlation also we need to understand. So that is why, now expanding that line equation, if I make it a generalized equation, then this is the equation that I would come up with. So I have many features, x1, x2, x3, x4 and some intercept and I have different coefficients for them which are affecting my end price differently. So now, for one such solved uh, thing, so this was the results that I got wherein it says that, so area income is affecting by this much. So now I have these many features, area income, age of the house, number of rooms, number of bedrooms, the population of the area and all these kinds of things. <laughs> so now these are the coefficients that it has come up with. So this is where it gets interesting. So who gave me these coefficients? Previously, when it was the straight line, it was easy for me to arrive because it was pure math. 
Then when it became something like this, now, now there was some confusion, so I had to figure out which line has the lowest residue. But now I have many such features and many different coefficients. So definitely this is not something that we can solve by hand. So this is where an algorithm comes in. So now the job of this algorithm would be, I have some set of data, say maybe 10,000 data points. And these 10,000 data points have features about the houses, area income, number of rooms and all those things. And I'll just feed this data to my algorithm. The job of this algorithm is to figure out the best fitting line for all these different data points that I have. So in other words, this algorithm will spit out coefficients and intercept. So making it simpler, this algorithm will give us back a line equation. And how does it give it? So it has iteratively, through many computations and many iterations, it has figured out that if you use these coefficients and this intercept, you will get the least error. Because there can be many lines that can pass through. The least error is the line that wins. So this algorithm helps me to give the least error of all of that. So that algorithm, in this specific example that we have taken, because it is giving me a generalized line equation, so that's also called as a linear equation. And this, the class of algorithm that we are dealing with here is also called as regression. So some words about why is it called as regression, that is because, say, uh, I suppose all of you are from Bangalore and kind of aware of the areas of Bangalore and things like that, right? So let me give a basic example of it. So now, if we think that, okay, the area of the house has the biggest impact, then if somebody comes to me and tell, and, and if they tell me that, okay, I have uh, a 5,000 or yeah, a, a 5,000 square foot area, go down house, whatever it can be. If they tell me that, and if they ask me that, if they only give me this information, and if they ask me, what do you think the price of my house would be, or the price of that godown would be, then maybe I would say, okay, it might go for 15 crores. So now here definitely, this 5000 is a stellar performance. It's a very high number, right? So, so, so that's what it says. So there is a stellar performance of one feature that it says it's 5000. But then, Next I ask them, so okay, where is this house? Is this in Kengeri or is this in Indranagar area or a more business uh, uh, centric area? So if that other person tells me that, no, it's at Kengeri. So then, then I would say, no, it's not 15 crores. Maybe you can sell it at 12 crores. And then if later they say that the flooring of it is the old cell mosaic flooring, then I may say, okay, that 12 crores, it may not be 12 crores, it may go for 10 crores. And then what you see here is that, because I have many features, in spite of a stellar performance of one feature, there will be other features in my data set, which will pull down the value of it towards the mean value of all other property prices in the area. So this is, this is called as regression. So if there is an average price in which somebody is selling something in that area, so your uh, price will only be closer to that average price and not too deviant or different from that average price. So that is called as regression. So the final value will always regress towards the mean value there. So now think about this thing. So from, from where this regression concept also started is from a study of something like this. So it's always a given thing that offsprings are kind of two inches taller than their parents. But if that were to be really true, they have had many generations of uh, uh, a human life and now human beings would have been hundreds of feet taller, right? But that has not happened. That is because 
it is not just this one feature that is your parents height that is affecting your height there are many other components which will finally your height will regress to the average height of it so that is why if you take one population so you will have people who are tall and people who are short but they will always be closer to the mean value so so if the mean value of bangalore is 5.7 you will still find people who are 6.1 and people who are say 4.8 but still the most of the population will stay up will still stay around the mean value if you take the same population from some other scandinavian country or from africa uh, where you have really tall people somewhere so then even though there are tall people they still are closer to the average height of that population there so that is what is called as regression so even though there is a feature which has a stellar performance there will be other features which will pull this to the final value that is what is called as regression this can be applied to various areas of uh, implementation say say cricket if talent and if somebody has a stellar talent then he will be able to perform well but there will be other features like say on what pitch they are playing and what time of the year is it humid is it dry which will affect their performance and even though they will score well their uh, numbers will always be closer to the mean and not a runaway number so so you will have batsmen whose averages are 60 and above but you will never have a batsman whose average is 600 and above so that is an important concept when it comes to regression and this class of algorithm is called as linear equation so now here where is the question of machine learning so i said we give data and then the algorithm will give me back coefficient and intercept and i will use that to tell what is the value for the new customer that comes in but this is where the trick is so the trick is now the algorithm that i have written once i write it that's a constant algorithm but the data i am feeding to this algorithm right if i change the data then the same algorithm will give me back different coefficients and intercept so that means that today if i have 100 data points and if i give it to my algorithm so it gives me some coefficient intercept tomorrow if i have 10000 data points and if i pass it to the algorithm it gives me better coefficient intercept because now it can look at more data points and figure out the right fit line for the data that we have so i'm making it a little bit simplified here that's not the only thing that affects it but the point here is your output or your algorithm is continuously learning about the data as and when you change your data set so this is a very important feature so if you use line equation 1 to make a decision today 10 days from now when you have more data points you will be using line equation 3 to make a decision on that data that you have so that means that with every change in data your machine is continuously learning and it is continuously giving you different coefficients and intercepts so that you can make better decisions because these coefficient and intercept will give you the least error in whatever prediction that you do there so that is a very important aspect there so here with this set of machine learning algorithms you can only predict the answers you will never be able to say an exact answer of it because it's not it's not a math equation which says x is equal to something plus something right so here based on the data you are trying to figure out the best thing and that will always have some errors there and your whole job was to reduce the error that you would have so now let me take another simple example there so now if you just toss a coin the possible outcomes of tossing a coin would be it would be head or tail so there are two possible outcomes so now if i say that 
So, on a random guess of head and tail, so there is a 50% choice, chance that somebody will guess it right. So, when you go for the toss and somebody says head, so there is a 50% chance that that can be true. But then you come up with an algorithm which says that, so, okay, so even though the coin is fair coin, which is giving you 50% probability, but maybe depending on whether you toss it on uh, a hilltop or you toss it closer to the sea level or you toss it on the or toss it on the northern hemisphere or southern hemisphere or the pressure. So now you are trying to collect all different other features which might affect the spin on the coin and then you say that now I have a better algorithm with me and if you apply this algorithm, so instead of having a 50% choice of winning the toss, you get 60% choice of winning the toss. So a very important concept here is your algorithm will not give them 100% success. But it has increased the rate of success. That is an important concept here. So now, if you equip Virat Kohli with this algorithm, and if no other has this algorithm, then Virat Kohli has now 10% extra chances of winning the toss than his opponent. And that is the business edge that you are giving to somebody through your machine learning algorithm. So with machine learning algorithms, you do not get 100% uh, right answers, but you get an answer which can be better than the rest. And also an important decision point. Right? So think that you wrote the best algorithm that you could, but then the probability of guessing it right is 40%. Then that algorithm is useless, right? Because if you just do a random guess, you have 50% success rate. Why will you implement an algorithm and reduce the success rate? Right? So that is what decides whether your algorithm is good or bad. If others can decide at 50% probability, if your algorithm can help them decide at 60% probability, then it's a good algorithm. If it's lower than that 50%, then it's a bad algorithm. When you have only two outcomes, which is head and tail. So that is an important concept with machine learning. And this is also the most difficult concept to convince your business on. So, how do you convince that your 60% answer is the best that you could and you could not increase it to 63%? So that is where the toughest job or anybody who is working on machine learning has. You will always be searching for changing your data set and features in such a way that the coefficients and intercepts that you get out will help you to achieve that 1%, 0.5%, 2% increases in what you already have as a benchmark there. So now let us go back to the definition of machine learning that we saw in the beginning of the slide. So in the beginning of the slide, now the computer program is said to learn from experience E. So in this case, the experience is data and features. When I feed my program with more data and features that I have collected, so I'm increasing the experience of that program. Right? So in this case, the data and feature is the, in, uh, is the experience. And then, what is the task here? Previously, the data and feature were the price of the house, the area of the house, and all those things. The task was to predict the price. Right? So when I predict the price, so that is the class of the task that I'm trying to do. And so now how do I say the machine is learning? The machine is learning because the performance measure P. So how do I measure the performance of it? The sum of the residuals or the error should be the least. So here it says the performance measure P of its performance at task T, that is in this task, how is it performing as measured by P? And that should improve with the experience E. So that means that the more data and features that I give to it, if it can start performing better in this price, and how do I say it's performing better? Because in this case, I'm measuring it by the sum of residuals, that is the error that it can, and if that error goes down, now I can say that the machine is learning. 
So the machine learns because its performance at the task is improving because you fed it with more experience. So that is the real definition of a machine learning algorithm. And that is why we say, and all this while, what is important to note is that your algorithm has not changed. It's the data that has changed here. And it is the output that you are referring to. So now, now let me tell you this uh, uh, example of it. And let me see if we can get this right. So now, I'll come to, I'll come to this slide of it. But let me first look at the example. So now, if I say that I have written a program which calculates tax of something. So I do some, I give some input and it gives me some output and my program calculates the tax. So for some input, if the tax that my program gave out is wrong, then where do you think the problem exists? Is the problem in my code or is the problem in the data? Can a couple of you answer on the uh, uh, chat? So the simple example was, if you write a program which calculates tax and you put some data and then the tax that comes out is wrong, then where do you think the problem lies? Does the problem lie in the software that you wrote or the problem lies in the data that you input? Good point. So I've got an answer which says the problem is in the algorithm. So somehow you did not write this part of the code which would calculate the tax correctly. So this is where, this is how your normal software development would happen. But in the case of machine learning, so you have written a machine learning program and this machine learning program has been working fine. But then, now the output that it is showing is the wrong output. Now where do you think the problem exists? Is it in the data or is it in the algorithm? Exactly correct. So that is the difference between a, a regular software program and the machine learning program. Here, the algorithm is correct. It does its job of finding the best fitting line. But the data that we sent itself was wrongly collected data. So your algorithm cannot do anything there. So in a machine learning algorithm, the problem will lie in the data. And in your regular software, the problem will lie in the algorithm that you have written. So that's where the machine learning programs are much harder to write, much harder to debug and much harder to understand it. So another example to prove this point is, so if I say that, so for a company on December, somebody sent out 1000 SMSs. On January, they sent out another 990 SMSs. And on February, they sent out 1100 SMSs. And now if they ask you to predict how many SMSs they might send on March, what would your answer be? Yeah. So you would say somewhere around 1000. But this is where the data that I gave you was wrong. Your algorithm is correct. Your algorithm told that it might be around 1000. But the data that I gave you was wrong because all these three months, December, January and February, there are occasions which will encourage people to send out more SMSs. So it can be about Christmas, it can be about New Year's Eve or New Year, or it can be about Shankranti or Pongal, or it can be about uh, the Republic Day, or it can be about Valentine's Day in February. But that way March is pretty dry, right? So the data that I gave you was wrong because I considered the seasonality impact on the data, but your algorithm did the right job. It told me that it is 1000, but the data that I sent was wrong. So this is where 
the machine learning problems will start to become a difficult area to work with. So, so now you are as and when you give more data. So if you were to give the previous year's data for March, then maybe we would have predicted it right closer to the actual value rather than considering data which has seasonality with it. So that is what machine learning does for us. So now, if you were to work on a machine learning algorithm, so this will be the high level steps that you would take. You would first acquire data and of all the data that you have, you perform an activity called as feature engineering. Feature engineering is, so whoever collected the data for you have given you 100 features. Maybe not all features are relevant for you. You may only pick features that can be relevant in deciding the price of something. So maybe the data acquired team would also might tell that what time the house was sold. Was it in the morning or in the evening? Maybe that doesn't have any impact on the price of it. So you will leave out that data and then you choose some data or you are expecting some data to be there but that's not there and then you ask for the data so that process is called a feature engineering. You decide of all the data that you have, what data, what features you think is important for your algorithm. And then you pass that feature to the algorithm and that algorithm will spit out the intercept of it and that activity is called as fitting the model. You are now fitting a machine learning model on the data that you have. And once you fit the model, you have to evaluate its performance. That is where the machine learns, right? So we have to evaluate the performance of that model. And if you think that the evaluation is wrong, then it is back to drawing board. You may want more data. You may want to decide on which features to take and which features to leave out. And then you fit the model again and then you evaluate. Then you go back to the drawing board, you do this. So for it is really wrong to measure a person on the lines of code he has written for machine learning algorithms because at the end of the day, it will be 10 lines of code that you write. But these end the number of iterations that you made to figure out the best possible features that will give the least error, that is a tedious task. And that is where the real gold lies. It's not in the number of lines of code, but the process that you took to arrive at those 10 lines of code, that is very, very important. So you would spend three weeks on the data, write 10 lines of code, but what you get out of the three weeks of effort, that model is the gold model and that you will use it to predict and make decisions for your business. So why should I be doing it? Why should I predict the house price? Because maybe as a real estate firm, my commissions are based on the price. So the, if I price it too high because I get good commission, the customer or the buyer might go to a different person. Or if I price it too low because I am eager for the sale, then my commissions will be very less. So what is that optimum pricing that I can do? So that is where these predictions will help us. That is where the algorithms will help us. So we call that prediction because we really do not know how much will it actually sell for. So I am predicting that given the information that you have given, uh, you can sell the house for X amount of time. So that is the prediction that you do. So when I talk about this prediction, one more interesting use case that comes to me is, so I think all of us pay premium for our life insurance, right? Every year, year on year. So if you think about it, how did they decide on the premium? They can decide on the premium depending on how they predict how long you are going to live. Very important concept. If some demographic buys a term insurance and if all of them drop off by the age they are 40, then the insurance company cannot pay out that term insurance, right? So they would have kind of put in a similar kind of prediction algorithm given the details of it 
So what is your earning? What kind of healthcare can you afford? On what kind of city that you are staying? What is the pollution in that city? And based on that, they predict that you no, know, this guy can most probably he will live until he is 70. And if he starts paying me this premium every year, then I can work out a business model where I can assure that even if somebody dies somewhere in between, I can still pay that out and the business can still survive. It's a very morbid use case. But it's really interesting to think. For that matter, these insurance companies are kind of predicting when their demographics can die. Right? So that's a very interesting problem to think about. Right? So for that matter, this insurance is an old uh, industry. So, so there is a story that when this insurance started off, these insurance agents, before they set the premium, they would ask the people to really open their mouths. That would be because they would look at the health of their dentures. So that means that if, the, if a person has good teeth, then he can eat and digest good food and he can live longer. That was one of the correlation for them to set the price. Very interesting concept, right? But now, now nobody does that. Now you have a lot of features and you can figure out those kind of details there. Pretty interesting problem there. But then for us to start working on this machine learning, the learning curve is pretty steep. There are a variety of technologies, domains, disciplines, because it's not just about the quality of code that you write, but it's also about the understanding of math and the domain that we have that can help us figure out a, a better solution. So let us look at one such mind map of the technologies. So I have prepared something for this here. So if you are interested in working on machine learning and if you look at how should I pace myself and what all should I learn so that uh, I can start working on machine learning, then, okay, I got a ping message telling that there are some questions. Okay. So then, first thing is, without worrying about machine learning, first we need to have good understanding of one programming language. So in the area of machine learning, you can either choose Python or you can also choose Scala. Especially Scala if you are working on big data technologies. But even within Python, even before you start working on machine learning, there are two modules called as Pandas and NumPy, which you will have to be thorough about. And so the regular style of programming that you do in C is procedural styles. With Java, it is object oriented. So similarly, there is one style of programming called as functional program, a very interesting way of solving problems. So even that is also something that we need to learn without machine learning in the picture. And after we do that, when I say after, parallelly or along with it or, or whatever it is, so that's the first learning. And then we also require some basic understanding of math and stats. That is, when I say this, you don't need to be 100% perfect on it and uh, you don't need to do deductions based on that. But at least that conceptual understanding of graph theory, what does it mean to have a polynomial equation, uh, a linear equation, what, are, what is coefficients, what is average, what is variance, what do you mean by standard deviation, so how does it affect the data that I have, probability, linear algebra. So, so to be honest, uh, when I started doing machine learning, that is when I started to appreciate my 10 plus 2 and engineering math a lot better. So now I, know, I really have a reason about why am I using this integration, differentiation, graph theory, and that you can really see it working when you are writing your uh, machine learning algorithms. So just reopen those textbooks, get that conceptual understanding of it, that's more than enough maybe the first two pages of each chapter. And then, this machine learning itself has many different areas of it. So machine learning itself has very three different areas. Prediction is what we saw. Similarly, there are areas like classification, recommendation and text. So it is also a good thing to understand these things from a theoretical aspect of it. So what does it mean by classification, what kind of algorithm, what visualizations we can get there. So once we understand this aspect of machine learning, only then we will be ready 
to start implementing machine learning algorithms. So when you want to implement machine learning algorithms, then the platforms you can choose are cloud or, or even your regular machine, but now it has become a lot more popular to use cloud machines for it. So some information about AWS or any other cloud platforms would be good. And then if you decide to work on big data, especially big data machine learning, then Spark is, some, is, uh, a, is something that will be very, very important to learn. So Spark helps you to do machine learning on big data uh, uh, world. And then distributed systems and uh, a distributed file system. So that, I'm only mentioning a few things here, but you can choose any of the competitor or alternate technologies there. So in no way I'm kind of professing these things, but the most common things that you find people using. So, and then there is also this standalone machine learning wherein I'm not dealing with big data, I'm dealing with reasonably sized data, which I think I can crunch on my, on my regular systems that I have. Then there is this very nice uh, uh, algorithm, I mean very nice library of Python called as scikit-learn. So we have to learn how this scikit-learn works. And then what you also see here is, it is not just important about writing the machine learning algorithm, but we should also know a few things about how do I take data? Is it coming from a database? Is it coming from a streaming source on the internet? Is it coming from files? Is it structured? Is it unstructured? So this understanding of ingestion data is all, will also become an important skill to have. In that state, so there are this Kafka, Spark, Glue, and Kinesis, some tools which will help you to understand data ingestion. So yeah, as you can as you can see here, the way to learning machine learning algorithms and implementing is is pretty steep. So there are a lot of uh, things to learn there. But that is what makes it very interesting. Right? So it's not see, really single dimension wherein you learn a programming language and then implement something. There is a lot more learning that you will also have to do. This is where it gives us the biggest of the opportunities also. Currently, the way the market is, everybody wants to implement machine learning algorithms behind their products, but they are now figuring out what kind of algorithms can I put. So that's what makes it a greenfield implementation. Greenfield is, it's very green. So you get to decide what kind of algorithms you can put. And then now there is also a very huge skill gap in the industry. So somebody might know programming, but they may not know the math behind machine learning. Somebody might know the math, but they may not know uh, uh, programming. Or if they know these things, they may not know about the domain. So there is really a huge uh, skill gap for this and that also calls for some kind of an end-to-end -end training that is required so that you really understand not just the aspect of implementing machine learning but also the aspect of how that sits behind the product and how is that helping people do a little bit more prediction. So that kind of an understanding is also something important and that makes this field a very excellent field and these are the current opportunities or the areas that we can start really working on. So now, now with this, I think uh, uh, I kind of, we started off with uh, just looking at what Gartner has to say and then we started off understanding what really this machine learning is. So from math equation to the actual uh, the confusion and what is your machine learning algorithm doing and if it is wrong the, wrong, the wrong is in the data. So we started understanding that and then finally we started to uh, 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 know about what is the learning roadmap that you have to take if you have to start working on machine learning. So this machine learning roadmap is really uh, a four to five month roadmap for you to really start out being productive with it.